Hideous Energy, episode 149. Almost halfway to 300. Nope. You're, what? 250 nah, plus? you're right. Yeah. I was just testing you, man. 150. I wanted to see how quick on your feet you were, math-wise, mathematically. No, I, I don't say shit unless I know it to be true. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Hideous Energy. We are a comic book podcast that talks about other things. Uh, in this episode, we will go off on tangents, I promise. That's a pretty perfect description of us. <laughs> Job well done, David. A comic book podcast that talks about other things. I didn't even think about the way that sounded. <laughs> Uh, you can find us online uh, wherever you found this episode, but also at hideousenergy.com. We have a blog spot. It's yeah. not that great. Uh, you can yeah. find us on iTunes, um, that, Facebook, Twitter. He, he made it sound like a question, but it's true. We're on iTunes. At the last time I checked. We were. So it kind of is a question. Uh, I can't definitively know that it's still there. I'm here to definitively tell you that it is there. Well, did you just check? Uh-huh. Right before I came. No, you didn't. It's one of my favorite things to do, is to check us. <laughs> to check and make sure. We're still there. That our free podcast yeah, that still up there. no one is harmed by. Um, no, we also have, uh, I think we've got like maybe six reviews, um, almost all of them from the year 2011. So That's not true. I forgot to tell you that we had a new one the other day, actually. On iTunes? Yeah, I'm going to read it to you. But first, um, talk about the other stuff. Uh, he already told you you can find us on uh, the internet. If you go to hideousenergy.com, it'll take you to fanoff.com. They host our show. And along with other podcasts, so maybe check some of those out while you're there. Spread the love, if you will. Okay. Um, follow us on Twitter at Hideous Energy. Uh, follow David on Twitter, DC underscore Hopkins. Follow me on Twitter, Austin R. Wilson. Um, we used to do a weekly webcomic called Super Cute with artist Brent Hibbert. It's not weekly anymore. We're failing miserably at posting the old uh, strips up on Facebook, which is probably a glimpse into why we're not doing the strip weekly anymore. Here it is. The um, most in-depth, insightful, and educated comics podcast for a truly highbrow comics fan. Also, lots of balls jokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brown, who's that by? Brown Coat uh, Siri? Sire. Si Brown coat Sire? Brown coat. C-I-R-E. Uh, thank you. To it's that. a five-star review, man. Yeah. Um, fantastic review, by the way. Um, also, just perfectly apt. Uh, yeah, perfectly apt for, for what we are. Um, because I, too, believe that we are the most in-depth and highbrow <laughs> show possible with also lots of balls jokes. And the, uh, the funny thing about that is that it's not talking about the quality of the balls jokes, no, just no, that no. there are lots. Yeah. So, like, you can't refute that. I also like... That's not even an opinion. The statement that there are balls jokes <laughs> and not ball jokes. Yeah. Because if, if I read that, I wouldn't think anything. But when ball I see jokes. it say balls jokes, yeah. that's just dead on. Ball jokes, you're like, I mean, A like base, sports? Yeah, baseball. You know that's not going to happen here. No, testes. Yeah. Uh, the genitals of the male species. D's nuts. Sometimes we talk about female genitals. Uh, that sounds... Sounds sort of creepy. Uh, <laughs> um, if you're the right lady, we'll talk about. <laughs> that's really gross. <laughs> that's what it sounded like we were going. Um, so no, we don't talk to girls. No, uh, they don't talk to us. I talk to my wife, and it's only to ask for permission uh, to talk to her. To anything and everything <laughs> that I need to do in life. Uh, I generally talk to my empty apartment. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the kitchen sometimes. Uh, mostly my bedroom. That's where the the bed and TV is. Um. I got almost into a fight with the guy today at work because he told me that when what I got kind married, of fight? like actual fight, not an actual fight. I like this dude, so hopefully he doesn't listen to this because this this really pissed me off. Almost guaranteed he's listening right now. Probably this goes out to you, Mister Pissed Off. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like making jokes about the whole man card thing, and like I don't have my man card anymore because I'm married, and I just held back so many mean things that I I wanted to say, and then then his buddy that he was talking to. I uh, made a really homophobic comment. Oh, good. And my gut reaction was to offer to suck, suck his, his dick. dick sure. Uh, which uh, I didn't say because I was at work. Also, you're their boss, I'm assuming, right? No, this this guy, I guess the other guy's like a manager in training. <laughs> <laughs> for, for listeners, <laughs> David's brand new kitten is in the room with us. Emery, the giant baby ass that he is, <laughs> doesn't like kittens. Em and David's cat is climbing all over Emery, <laughs> and it is literally like watching someone fighting away a bee. <laughs> <laughs> he was Watson is his name. He was smashed in, into Emery's face. <laughs> He's just the cutest little shit on the planet. Uh, lastly, if um, you want to buy comics, we recommend that you buy them from Discount Comic Book Service. You probably already True. do because they're the biggest and bestest yeah. of all the comics retailers around. Yeah, they're not the bully, though. No. They want to be your friend. No, they want to hang out. Yeah. Uh, Discount Comic Book, nope. DCBService.com. There you go. Um, you can go there. You can use our one-time use only promo code if you have never used it because it's one-time use only. I told you three times in that sentence that you can only use it once. I'm going to say it again. So don't be a sneaky. You can only use it one time, which means if you've never used it before, you still can. After then, you can't anymore. You can be sneaky. It just won't work. Um, Hideous8 is the code. H-I-D-E-O-U-S and the number 8. 
Uh, so make sure you use that. That'll get you an additional 8% off, which at first glance you might be like, 8%? That sucks. Um, but that sucks. That sucks. Balls jokes. But they're uh, they're on where I was going. Their <laughs> their online discount is already forty percent off. So if you add our code, you're going to be getting forty eight percent off your entire order. That's exactly right. Um, and that's not any like weird like forty eight percent off only singles or like you order comics there. Whatever you order, it's going to be forty eight percent off if you use our code. Um, so make sure if you use it, you get a lot of stuff. You spread the word, tell other people about the code, get people there. Um, DCBS can tell when. Uh, their customers use our code they can um and it reflects well on us because we have an awesome relationship with them and we love them and yes. they like us so um note that i said we love them and they like us i don't I know, know if they love us yet um they'll come around maybe um no they will maybe yeah. i thought of a really dark thing to say i'm gonna keep it in the thanks man keep it in the brain head i appreciate that um if you listened to the show last week i sure fucking hope you did we interviewed Tim Gibson, uh, creator of Moth City, a online web comic, e-comic, if you will. He is, in fact, a moth, too. Uh, he it's, is. I mean, it's unrelated. The comic's not about him being a moth, but he is he is a moth. Yeah, um, just one of those rare happenstance <laughs> things. <laughs> well, isn't it? I think it's statistical, like in uh, New Zealand. Is it like one in every 50 people are born a moth? Yeah. Just like a perfect moth? Yeah. The re- all, 49 of them are kiwis, and then that last <laughs> one's a moth. <laughs> No humans. It's just moths and no, fruit. Ki- I, ki- I know, ki- but the way... Oh, is it a bird? Yeah. Do you think they're named after the fruit? Well, no. What's the? Am I? Is my? Am I freaking out? There's a fruit called a kiwi, right? Yes. There's a yeah, fruit a called, called a kiwi. Green thing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, but that's not what they're. That's not why kiwis. I assumed are it was something completely. Di- I didn't think that they were named after fruits. They but... love the kiwi fruits. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> well, they love the bird apparently. But we interviewed Tim Gibson. Uh, it was a super awesome conversation for us. We made a bunch of jokes about how he was living somewhere that was a day ahead of where we were. Times on times on rise. And not and now calling him a moth. So uh, yeah. So we're really just burning bridges. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, Tim, shut up. <laughs> I wanted to further burn the bridge. I uh, know, but um, Tim stopped by and he, uh, as you know, you can read Moth City for free on thrillbun.com. You can even go to mothcity.com and read it for free. But you can purchase the the singles, the, the e-singles yeah. uh, through Comixology. But you can also buy them through Tim's website. Uh, Tim, a uh, gracious creator and awesome dude that he is, is offering a discount to all Hideous Energy listeners on all of um, his online content. Right. If you go to his site, mothcity.com, and type in the code hideous kiwi, K I W I, like the fruit, uh, you will get 50% off of any digital comics in the cart. And like the DCB service code, it's one time use only. So if you just want to check out one issue of Moth City, it'll only be 50 cents through him. Uh, but that's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, you can get. Five, He's kind of dumb, man. So he of. shouldn't be giving away his comics for that cheap. Uh, you know what? I was like, that's dumb, but I'm gonna do it. For you. <laughs> You're gonna lose a lot of money. Get ready. I'm gonna do it, man. <laughs> uh, he, you can get all five comics, uh, which is issues one through four, plus the Prelude comic of Moth City. And they're hefty. They're not. No, there. It's there's a lot of content. Yeah. Not not uh, not only just the comics. I'm gonna get to that in a second. It'll only be five dollars. Yeah. If you get every single thing that he has done for Moth City, on it's a dollar more him. than a Marvel or DC book yeah. that you're buying that's not good on his website. Only. Are you buying Deadpool? Then don't don't do that. Don't do that. Stop. <laughs> um, so, but also, um, they're they're high definition PDF files, and they all have author's notes and a little bit of bonus material as well. So that's another reason to go through Tim. Um, also, if you go through Tim's website through MothCity.com and use this code, um, Tim is going to get more of the money. And if you use this code, it will be severely discounted, but still. He's going to get something for the work uh, that you can read online completely free. So you don't have to buy it. Um, it's one of those things where you're supporting a creator that you love. Um, we recommend that you buy it. Absolutely. You should. Uh, this if, is a, not only because it's great content, but this is just a fucking dumb deal. If like, you, it's, not, it's dumb. <laughs> if you haven't uh, listened to the interview that we did with him last week, then go listen to it. Um, if you've not heard about it or want to know more, that should sway you if you're not already swayed by 50 cents per yeah, issue. It's dumb. Um, this this show goes up on um, September 25th. Yep. So starting today, uh, three days from now. Also, speaking of, since we're ta- we're dating the show, yeah. this uh, the show we're not going to be talking about that Shield show in case anyone's wondering. Yeah, we haven't been. Able it's to... it's air- like it's getting ready to start in three yeah, minutes. We so. can't watch it, so um, talk about it next week. We will. Um, so three days from now, September 25th, 2013, this code will end. It's three days only. Um, so if you want to use it, make sure you do it quickly in between that time, uh, that amount of time. And if you know someone who might like it 
or you want someone to see it, make sure you tell them about it quickly because it's a very short-lived code. Three days from now, we're going to announce it. Well, and also, like, if you if you do have someone else that you know want to check it out, maybe just buy it for them. Maybe, Like, yeah. buy it twice. Well, $5 for five comics is it's a great deal. Yeah, that's nuts. Uh, five long comics with bonus content as well from, from Tim Gibson. You definitely should do it. So yeah. keep that in mind, guys. Uh, um, that's kind of it, right? What else do we got? I think that's it. Maybe. Um, I guess I guess we talk about comics now. I, I read some. I didn't. It's going to be interesting. It'll be weird. Read them and weep. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about a lot of books that came out today. We are. This literally Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. This the, day, the so 25th. If you haven't headed to the comic book shop yet to buy your books or order them through DCBS or if they're not at your house yet... Um, we're going to spoil... You're going to be pissed. <laughs> East of West, number six, uh, Saga, number 14, Sex Criminals, number one, and Rat Queens, number one. Correct. All those are going to get spoiled. And yeah. Thor, uh, God of Thunder, number 13. Forgot to read that one. Did you? Yep. Okay. Not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that came out last week, though. Um, it was a sweet issue. Ron Garney did the art. Really? And it's about the... Is it inked? Now, no. See? It still looks good, but it's... That was the one thing that I always remembered about Garney stuff is it was it never, doesn't look inked. never inked. It says it says artist and then it says color artist for the other for the person who colored it obviously. Yeah, um, there's not an inker, which I mean, obviously could mean that Ron Garney inked it too, but it doesn't look inked. It looks like his pencils have colors over them. Well, from what which I is, remember, his is, art's good and his pencils are tight. Well, from but, what I remember, they don't ink his stuff because of speed, or either either speed or because it looks better uninked. I can't remember. He, I don't know. It hasn't been inked for a while. Well, Sergeant, all of Wolverine Weapon X. Well, that Sergeant Rock stuff. He didn't draw that. You're right. That was uh, that's um, Tucci. Billy Tucci. Yeah, the Tucci. The Tucci. Yeah. The comics Tucci. <laughs> um, what, did Tucci do that Scar stuff? That's Ron then? Garney. That was Garney. Yeah, but he did Wolverine we- Weapon X with Jason Aaron. Remember that? Yeah. Series that I had do. like laser claws and all I do. That yeah. Stuff. Uh, which series. sounds dumb, but that those laser claws were cool. Um. None of that's going to get reviewed. No, we're not talking about any of that. First book up, uh, Rat Queens, number one. Um, this is a book that um, – had you heard about this book before today? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if you'd been following it. I've been following it for a long time. I hadn't been following it as – I heard about it from you. Oh, okay. Um, it's by Curtis J. Wiebe, uh, who wrote Peter Panzerfaust, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Um, illustrated by Rock Upchurch. Never heard of him, although I like his art. I do like his art. Like if his it is, name. in fact, a man. Um, yeah, it might be a girl. Letters by Ed Brisson, um, and uh, uh, he colored it too. Rock Where? Up Church did because there's not a colorist. Oh, um, okay. So right off the bat, everything that I had read about this book, yeah, made it sound like um, it was people playing a game. Yeah, playing a game, and I didn't get like no, like no, like I know, but playing not... a tabletop RPG. Yeah. Well, like remember... and you seeing their characters and everything. I remember you, and I guess it could still be that. It could. I don't think it is. I don't think it is either. So it, like, you know what? If it is at this point, I would be pissed. I wouldn't be pissed, but it was hard for me. Like you go into a book with expectations. Obviously, any book that you read, even if they're minimal, or yeah. at least about what you know. I guess holding that against this book though is. Oh, I'm not. I'm not holding it against it. I'm just saying, like, it was yeah. a it was a weird read for me because the whole time, yeah, I went in with this conception that they gave to me in like interviews and in promotional stuff that I had read and seen everywhere else that, that it was, was a group of friends and their characters, and it's. Dungeon, I don't think it's that. <laughs> well, it was dungeon raiding, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that was what I had seen you either tweet about or you said something about. I can't remember. Cause... And the, the art and the writing and the, the excerpts and stuff that I had seen looked really awesome. Yeah. And it's it's an all female cast. So I was no, excited. Not all female cast. The main, the main, the main, the rat queens uh, protagonists are, are female. Are female. So I was I was pumped about that. So I, I honestly probably need to read it again now, knowing that that's not what they advertised it as. Well, see, I which I I'm not going to hold against Weeby obviously because I I have to judge the book based off of the book, not off of the lead up. <clears throat> yeah. But it was really strange reading it because I I kept waiting or looking and I was like I don't know that this is what I thought it was going to be. I'm interested to see what you read, um, just to see like how they made it sound um i remember uh i don't think it was anything where they were <laughs> weebies in an interview like he's like yeah they're playing dnd make sure that this you understand that these are real people with fake characters <laughs> like it wasn't anything like that but it was it, it, they really always punched up the idea of um role-playing games and role-playing yeah and having characters so uh, i mean i guess they still could i guess they could be anyway if... i mean it's it's a fan it's like a fantasy action comedy kind of yeah would you describe yeah, it as it, such it is yeah 
Um, this is by far the funniest book we read out of the uh, the group of stuff that we read, which is going to play a part into my review of a later book. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's set in a fantasy world, um, pretty Dungeons and Dragonsy sort of. Oh, very. Um, a, a big mixture of all of those uh, different games. Yeah. Um, uh, or different worlds. You know, it's not not cliche um, in the sense that well, it might be. I think it's pretty. I don't know. Cliche makes it sound. I think it's pretty cliche, but I think cliche, that it's cli- supposed to play up those well, tropes. Cliche sounds detrimental. Yeah, um, that's what I'm I, saying. And I don't mean it to be that way. No. Like he's using these, this sort of world and which again knowledge of previous fantasy and, and all of that stuff. That was another thing they focused on. They were like, like all uh, role playing game parties, you have. A fighter, a rogue, See, a cleric, like all the stuff, and you have that in here. It makes me feel like they were just comparing it. And they like might have been that he uses that mechanism from a storytelling standpoint. Like he peopled the world. Yeah, with no, those he very. He obviously did. Yeah, like um, those those, those uh, characters that you can recognize immediately. Yeah, um, it's. I liked it a lot and had a lot of fun with it. I thought it was okay. Um, a lot of the humor was funny. A significant portion of it to me was pretty stupid <laughs> but the only thing that i didn't like was the fake cell phone uh where the girl picks up the rock that was another reason i thought like, and, like that was another thing where i was rock. like okay so maybe this is maybe and, i misread it and this and, is like an mmorpg or something yeah like an mmo or it's world of warcraft or something like that almost all the other humor in the book uh landed for me and, and yeah, i okay. laughed and I, was I, okay. I wasn't like howling a lot of it was her, but... well like some of it was really funny when it was more subtle there were other times where i was like this is easy, which uh, we kind of do the same thing. Well, no, we do. Um, in terms of like so calling someone dick cheese. That's, like That's why we criticize people for it. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying like to me it wasn't that funny because a lot of them I was like, this is an easy joke. Well, the, This is an easy. I think one of the parts that I found the funniest. I guess was... I don't think about it like that, though. When we do the podcast, like I'm not like, all right, let's put some material out there that we're creating. We're well, just no, talking. I mean, we're so, just... I mean, it's. In this case, the stuff that I laughed at the most um, wasn't the, wasn't the stuff where it was like, um, like build up, build up punchline. Yeah. That stuff kind of made me giggle. The part where uh, one of the characters says, um, uh, it, it was literally like, I couldn't give it. I don't think I could give zero or I give zero fucks. Oh wait, I found a fuck to give. And then she flips, flips him, him off. off. Yeah. Like that made me giggle. Yeah. But it was a very quick thing that I moved past. Um, which is, again, makes me wonder if potentially it still is because like, the, all the humor does not fit into the um, like kind the of, fantasy setting. Kind of not. It's, like they kind of talk like I mean, kind of. It's weird. They talk like uh, modern day young adults that are in a fantasy world, which yeah. again is why, like the whole time, I was well, like, maybe this isn't what I thought, but the, maybe it is. The only time or any the only thing that happens within this world where I could see it. He he is either leading us to the point where he's like, oh, by the way, they're just playing an MMO, yeah, like MMO RPG, whatever. Is the the phone thing yeah. where one of the characters picks up a glowing rock and holds it up to her head like a phone? I thought she like conjured it out of. Oh, I guess it is a rock, yeah. yeah. Um, and talks to her mom, yeah, through this rock like a phone. Um, that's the only time. Everything else seems to fit into the world pretty pretty snugly. Um, but that, that was where I was like, Oh, okay. That's I like, I get it, but it's just, uh, that's kind of over the line for me and not where it's like break. <laughs> that's, that's over the line. <laughs> absolutely offensive. No, but like where, it, where it was, um, moving so far past the setting to where it would be like, if one of the girls was like, I want to go drink a Coke. Yeah. And then they'd be like a what? And she'd be like, it's this special drink. The goblins make Yeah, like something like that. It, it tiptoes up to being that, Yeah, but it isn't completely. I laughed a lot um, during the book, and I especially laughed when they were in the prison, and I think his name's like Mr. Silver, is giving out the, the assignments to all of the teams. Yeah. And the names of the teams and the characters on all the teams made me laugh. And they it wasn't one of those, like, it wasn't specifically set up to be a very obvious, like I was saying earlier, like build-up, build-up, punchline mm-hmm. joke. But, you know, you could tell there was humor written into into the scene where it's, like, one of the teams, I think they're called, like, the Peaches, and yeah. then there's one that's, like, fucking, like, festering darkness or something. There's, like, bro ponies or something is one of them. It's I, it's not the bro ponies. Um, it's very close. I, it's, I don't think it's the bro ponies. Let's just read the names of the teams and spoil the book completely. 
Um, I'm trying to find page it. Page one. Let's read the. It's Brother Ponies. Yeah. Rat Bra- Queens, Peaches, Four Daves. I, yeah, I liked that. Brother Ponies and Obsidian, Obsidian Darkness. Darkness. Uh, Obsidian Darkness got assigned to go clean the, the latrines. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I laughed a lot through the book. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think what it was is I, I didn't. I didn't go in with completely uh, incorrect expectations and have them not be there. They're not. They weren't incorrect. It was just like no, dude. Like I'm. I was. That's jump. not my fault. No, <laughs> like it, uh, no, dude. Like, like everything. The way it was pitched, it was all very about like this is like ro- RPG tabletop D and D gaming. Like it's. Everything was pitched that way. I'm I, sure if I go back now and read it like they're really just, closely, they're just saying. I'm sure there was comparisons and stuff, like using that world um, or the concepts. I mean, it or settings. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I still like once it, once I realized it wasn't what it was. It's not like I threw the comic down. I mean, it. I I, I understood. I was like, oh, okay, I misunderstood what it was about. Um, yeah, and I laughed at some of it. <laughs> I laughed at parts of it. Like I like I said, a lot of it was just really easy easy jokes to me so that it didn't really catch me some of them they did though well it's um i like the four main characters and i I like the way they interact with each other uh like we said at the beginning they're four girls um who are warriors you know going out to they get an assignment to go clear this cave uh so they go out to do that obviously not everything goes according to plan you know the drill yeah um i want not to say that it's like paint by numbers I um, kind of is like I, I don't think it is. I want to read the next issue because I want to see more character because yeah. this had a lot more action in it than yeah. I like to see because I'd rather know more about them than them like hitting things with swords. I but, I don't know. I can't say you won't get that, but I get the feeling that this is going to be a hitting things with swords book. Yeah, um, which is fine. Uh, I had fun with it. Uh, it is only the first issue, so the amount of character that you could put into the first issue while still setting the story up is going to be minimal. Yeah. Um, but I, I liked it. Um, and I liked the art a lot. The art's the best part about it for um, sure. His, his art is good, man. It reminds me of a little bit of Fiona Staples. It's he's got a Fiona Staples. He's got a thing going Staples-esque. on there. It's not exactly obviously, but no. Um, I like his art a lot. Yeah. The, uh, did, you, did the lettering bother you? No, I like Ed Brisson's lettering. I do too. So what'd you know. give this out of 10? Five and a half. Six, something like that. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's not It's not a bad book. I said that from the beginning. Uh, the only reason I asked that is because I give it a six. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad book by any means. It just, um, I, I want to read it again, like going into it with a different headspace, but the, the I mean, the humor's not going to change. It didn't grab me like it did you. It might. I don't know. I mean, there is a possibility that uh, because you were expecting one thing and you didn't get it, that it changed your outlook of the book. I'm not saying it did. That is a possibility. I mean, ultimately, I'll reread it and find out. Ultimately, it's not going to alter it a lot because no. it's like the only thing that it would alter is that there's not characters behind these characters. Yeah, not in this issue. So, I mean, it's not like I went into it thinking like, oh, I thought this was a sequel to Stargate. <laughs> like, it's it's not like I was wildly off base or I'm, off course. I'm happy you didn't think that. <laughs> if you came to me one day and you were like, dude, this book is not a sequel to Stargate. And I was like, that book is not... That's pretty in pink, man. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's its own uh, thing. You do you think everything is Stargate? <laughs> <laughs> what if I did? Um, I guess I would try and love you <laughs> for who you are. I would have a lot to watch, though. You would, yeah. Uh, a lot of it subpar, as what from what I can tell. Have you watched any of it? Uh, never. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Emery likes it. I just think it looks awful. Like the the quality of the show looks so low. I watched um, when I was a kid. I watched Stargate and then they had in Brazil, like it was before the advent of the internet being what it was too. Yeah. Um, but also in Brazil, like what it was like, it's not around anymore, (laughs) (laughs) but like in Brazil, they would package stuff at the video stores as, um, like series or like sequels. Yeah. So like I rented what I thought was the sequel to Stargate, which when I was a kid, I didn't realize I never made a sequel, but it SG one. Well, it was the pilot. It was like an extended pilot to the TV show. So it was like an hour and a half long. So it was a movie. Um, well, no, but it was the pilot to the show. Like it wasn't a movie that they well, like yeah, put out in theaters. Yeah, but that's movie length. Yeah, but it wasn't a movie. It, it oh, was yeah. created for television. Yeah. So they make movies for TV. Uh, so <laughs> what are you wanting to, what are you wanting to argue about? It wasn't a theatrical film is what I'm saying. I thought it was, oh, a, yeah, but that doesn't a, mean it's not a movie. I don't have it's enough semantics. patience to argue with you about this. Let's, let's go on. But I watched the whole thing thinking it was a sequel. They did the same thing with is Mortal a, Kombat. Is it a prequel? 
I don't know what it is. I, I think it's like a kind of a sequel, but they. Ch- I read about it the other day, actually. Well, I know they that changed they some changed stuff. things, like when... They did the same thing with Mortal Kombat. There's a Mortal Kombat TV show. I remember that show. And I thought it was um, Mortal Kombat 3. And I remember... The way it was <clears throat> labeled on the box. I even hated the films, like the... The movies, <laughs> to call those Mortal Kombat things films. Whatever, man, those are great. Well, the first one is. I hated them. Um, and they, really, you didn't like the first one? No. Um, were you too old? Uh, I think the quality was too low. Is that what the problem was? <laughs> is that it was just bad? No, because you like lots of bad stuff when you're young. Uh, never me. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. <laughs> no, I you're think, right. Monster Squad's great, man. It is. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'll it fucking is. fight to the grave with it's, anyone it's who great, says dude. it's not. It's so great. Yeah. I look. It's not my fault. You can't detect quality. No. It's, it isn't your fault that I watched it when I was, like, 21. You're right. That's not my fault. <laughs> Monster Squad is one of those weird 80s movies um, that is really, really liberal with the word faggot. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, just like uh, uh, Teen Wolf was. Like He only said it remember, once, but well, it was yeah, enough for us to be like, no, holy Like li- Liberal in the sense that they're letting protagonists that you are supposed to like yeah. say them um, because you and I were watching it. And Does he say – he says fag. He does, yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. I didn't think he said faggot. Um, in Monster Squad. That it, word hits me like a oh, yeah. sack of bricks. In Monster Squad, it's one of the one of the villains who says it. Um, one of, <laughs> like one of the who does he call? It's it, Dracula. No, it's one of the little kids. <laughs> he calls one of the little kids? No, dude. One of the little kids says it. To who? To one of the uh, protagonists, one of the main characters. Oh, really? Yeah, the very beginning of the movie. Is the is there a connotation that it's gay, or is he just being like, "Don't be a dickhead," like saying it in that way? Um, because when I was a kid, I used to say stuff was gay all the time, just like a well, lot yeah. of little kids did. I'll because... quote it to you. Okay. Um, uh, Horace, uh, who the villains call fat kid. Um, <laughs> like I said, it's good. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's quality writing. Um, Horace is reading a comic book, and then uh, the kid who plays Ben's brother in the wonder years um ben savage it's i call him by his first name okay um i forget what his name is but he was in Wee's big adventure and he was a big actor in the 80s he still acts um now um he walks up to horace he rips his comic book in half um which is fight time for me <laughs> Uh, he rips his comic in half, and then he takes his um, Snickers bar away from him and puts it on the ground and steps on it. Um, and I think Horace calls him like a jackass, or he says something to him, and that kid pushes him and goes, What'd you say, faggot? What'd you say? Oh, okay. Um, it is part- So in an acceptable way. If you say it that way, it's okay to say, right? In the 80s, uh, <laughs> apparently they were not too worried about it. Man, that's it. weird. Isn't it? I mean, I I guess like there could be words that we say now that, could totally change there's a lot of them i would imagine that will probably change i really hope um we're not saying pimp as much as we are now <laughs> it like, means something in, well, it does mean something well i know it but i mean something completely different well no i know but i mean like in the future it means like child molester or something oh, yeah, we're like that's so pimp oh no yeah you come back to these these episodes <laughs> and somebody's like oh my god they say pimp and righteous every other word i can't believe these guys aren't in jail uh all right, next we have Saga number 14. Yeah. Written by Brian K. Vaughn, illustrated by Fiona Staples. Yes. Um, it uh, has letters and design by Phonographics, who I was so happy that after issue 10, they still wrote the number out on the cover. <laughs> Remember when the oh, first yeah. issue started coming out? You were it, this is like about chapter one written out, O N E. Yeah. And I was like, man, I wonder if they're going to get up in the double digits and stop doing this because I love how it's written out. They're yeah. still doing it. So. Uh, I give it a 10. I'm happy you got what you wanted. I give it a T T E N <laughs> Out of that. Because um, I 100% wouldn't have noticed that at all. On the cover? No. Um, the cover has that donut moon, by the way. It does. I, you know what? I thought about that as soon as I uh, looked at the issue. I didn't notice until just now. Um, wait, are all these book image books? Yeah. That's why we're, they're all, that's, we got them from the FTP, man. That's exactly what I was just thinking. Jesus. I said that at the beginning of the segment. Did you? Yeah, the, all these books come out today, so it's going to be spoilery. You didn't say that they were image books, though. Well, no, but I mean, we've I, said that in the, a ton in the past. Where if we ever review a book the day of, it's because we got it from image. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I was looking at the cover, and I was like, oh, Donut Moon. Brian K. Vaughn was drunk. Funny. <laughs> That's <laughs> a good story. My, my thought process. That's a good story, man. You guys wanted to know what else I was doing. Um, what'd you think about this issue of Saga? Uh, I liked it. Um, I thought it was good, man. Um, it, uh, it definitely is more focused on character than it was on like the overall plot. There were some little, what the, the series or the, for the series, previous yeah. issues because for the, for the series. Oh, um, because it's not, 
there's a little bit of like forward movement at the very, 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 like basically like the last two pages. Yeah. Um, but it focuses more on the interaction between the will and I forgot her name. I don't remember it either. It's, uh, uh the main guy's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> I don't remember anyone's name. His name's Marco. Marco. All I could think of was Marcus. Marco. Um, and then their interaction with the slave girl who they've named Sophie. Uh, then you got a lot more interaction between, um, the, uh, unnecessary, uh, character who is a writer. <laughs> he's not unnecessary. Yeah, it's unnecessary say. that he's a writer other than Brian K. Vaughn can't help himself. That's not true. Other than, I mean, he wrote the books. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that we don't know that it's unnecessary. PKV a can't yeah. help, but do this stuff. And it drives me crazy. Only at this point because we know that he loves doing it. And so far in what everything do you, he's done, what do he's you mean? either put in a writer or put in some type of meta commentary in some way. Sometimes it's very on the nose, well, like so in Why far, the Last Man. And sometimes it's a, lot, a, little, a little more subtle, like in this, where this guy just happens to be a writer. Well, so far the meta commentary within Saga has been few and far between. Um, there, it's definitely less than Why. It is. 100% less than Y yeah. and less than Ex Machina. Yeah. Um, so far, this guy being a writer is, it, first of all, it plays largely into Marco and Alana's life, and you find out why in this issue. Well, they, they had speculated, or Alana specifically had speculated, that those, like, you know, quote unquote trashy, like romance novels yeah. ha were basically had a subtext, which was a bigger story, and they were metaphors for other things. So they wanted to go find this dude on the planet Quietus. If you want to hear a top five about what we thought about that name, correct? Like maybe four episodes back. There's another uh, planet mentioned in this issue called Jetsam. Is it? Yeah, I didn't notice that. So, um, <laughs> so there you go. And when you find out in this issue that she was right, um, yeah. that there was a deeper thing well, within the books. Basically, like he's a uh, kind of like a revolutionary yeah. who's writing these books, coding them into yeah, his... disguised as bodice rippers, these yeah. like trashy romance novels, and that's. Not what they are, um, which I guess could potentially be meta commentary from Brian K. Vaughn saying that romance novels are deeper than they would seem. I guess I mean in this one, it's so hard for me to read. If anything about writing books or writers are mentioned, it's so hard for me to not look at it. We've talked about this in the past as like, oh, hey, Bri. Well, no, <laughs> like no, that's, I know that's you talking and not Do you know one of the reasons, this Cyclops beard guy. One of the reasons I think that is is because Brian K. Vaughn sees the power um, – that pop culture can hold over people. Yeah. Including himself. Yeah. Like he loves pop culture so much that he can't stop writing about it and why the last man to the detriment of the story and points. Yeah. And in this case in saga, I think this is the beginning of that, um, of showing that, that Alana and Marco's lives were affected by pop culture. Yeah. Um, so far it hasn't dove down to the part where he's like, no. comic books don't use recycled paper. <laughs> no, it's not bad. It's just like, it's it's so hard for me. It's like there was an issue of Ultimate Spider Man where um uh the Molten Man, it's not really his name. Um uh, but that's it was the ultimate version of the Molten Man. Wasn't he was a, in a band. It was a band. They're called the Molten Men. Yeah, but they called him the Molten Man too because he oh. was a, a well no, like the girls did. Yeah. Like because he was a smook and hottie. Smook and hottie. What's his name? I can't remember. But Mary Jane like it was like, when they're broken up, she talks to him. She goes out on a date with him. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And he it wasn't bad because it was we talked about it either on or off the air. He talked about how this character in the comic looked up so much to Will Eisner because Will Eisner had created the, you know, quote unquote, the graphic novel. It was yeah. something the world had never seen. And that's what he wanted to do with his music. He wanted to create something that was unique that had never been done before. Yeah. But it was hard for us to read it and not realize, okay, Brian, that's Brian Michael Bendis obviously thinks a lot of Will Eisner Yeah. and for it to not, and it's completely fine for a character to like Will Eisner in a it book, is. but it was really hard for us to separate like Mark. Is his name Mark Roxon or Roxanne or something? It might be. Like it's hard for us to separate that this kid likes it as opposed to Brian, Brian, Bendis Michael Bendis like probably likes him. Well, it's like, uh, well, I don't know. Comics is just such a small, small world as far as, um, people who enjoy them, which I, I know it's bigger now than it used to be, but still people who enjoy the movies are not always necessarily the people who are reading these comics. Yeah. Um, which is not an exclusivity thing and it's not like an elitist thing. It's just a fucking fact. Not everyone who goes sees those sees those movies reads comics, and I can the reason I know that's true is because the uh, the Avengers movie made a fucking billion dollars, and comics are surviving, not thriving. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, yes, they're thriving. Let's let's fucking fight. 
who said they weren't what it was me i was answering myself <laughs> oh i didn't disagree with you they're thriving now more than they ever have but still oh i don't think they're thriving i agree <laughs> well they're thriving in a sense that they're not on a very very failing on a very small scale where like thriving means surviving <laughs> then i agree well, see, i don't think they're just surviving no, I mean, I don't think that we're, like, in the last days of comics. No. But it's not the 90s. No, I mean, no. we're not selling. Well, we don't want it to be the 90s. I mean, in terms of sales. Well, sales, we do want that. Yeah. We want the sales from the 90s. We don't want it to be sales just because. Pockets on people's faces and stuff. I would read that, I guess. <laughs> if you tell me why those pockets are there. There's um, no way that the answer would be something satisfying enough that you would be like, all right, let's do it. Pocket face. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in this issue, um, we meet, I forget the guy's name. It's Brian Michael Bendis with one eye. It's Brian K. Vaughn with one eye. No, nah, that's, not, that's not how I read it, man. <laughs> oh, this is supposed to be Brian Michael Bendis. Yeah, you read it wrong is the problem. Um, it's an interesting issue. Um, two of my favorite parts in it dealt with emotion. Um, um, I'm going to be uh, straight up with you and tell you that I cried at something in this. If it was probably the part where it has to be, there's the only one like really heavy emotional the he scene in the book. Well, and there, that made me cry. There's two heavy emotional scenes in the book. There is one that's heavier. Um, just strictly from, uh, well, it depends. I don't want to talk it about it. What? I know, like, I don't want to ruin it for people. Cause I thought about like talking about well, it. It's a giant spoiler. So if you don't want to hear this, read the issue first. Um, maybe we're talking about different things then. I think we're talking about the same thing, but there's two parts in the book that made me tear up. And the first one was when, uh, Marco's mom is talking to the writer. Yeah. Um, and she's very pissed off, um, and standoffish. And, um, the writer is like, yeah, you, you know, that war you fought in my fucking wife died in that war. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, yeah, well, she shouldn't have fought. A lot uh, Marco's mom's like, Marco's she shouldn't mom. have fought on the, the fought against side, him basically. Then. And he was like, I forget what he says, but then Marco's mom is like, "Why don't you guys get out of here and let the no?" He talk. says that she she was like a, a singer in the town. Oh, yeah, she, she was wasn't a, in the army. Innocent bystander. Yeah, she was. She got killed. So Marco and Alana and the ghost nanny <laughs> leave with their baby, um, which the writer puked on at one point in this issue. <laughs> that made me laugh because I was not expecting it me either. And when I first saw it, I was like, "It was a ceremonial thing." Or. It was like his race yeah. did something. No, that's what I thought too. Yeah, because she's talking about it being a ceremonial thing that the babies are on other planets. Yeah, though. bathed. Yeah. So then he fucking barfs on her, and it's because he's drunk. <laughs> the next panel, Fiona Staples did a good job with their faces because it is just oh, yeah. pure terror that they just watch this guy throw, throw up, up on, on a child. Baby. They all react pretty well to it. Uh, so Marco, Alana, and the ghost nanny leave with the baby, and then this rider guy. <laughs> His name we can't remember. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, talks to Marco's mom, and he's like, he's like, I know. I know that you lost someone, and from what it looks like, or his mom, Marco's mom says, do I wear it on my face that plainly? And the guy's like, yeah, and I can tell, I can tell <laughs> yes. it's pro probably pretty recent. And he talks about how his son dying um, was one of the worst things that ever happened to him. Well, um, she's she, she's she's assuming that he's talking about the son, and he says, "Don't get me wrong, that almost killed me, but that's not what devastated my life for the rest of my life. Yeah. It was my wife, the first person I ever loved, getting killed, and obviously their son hasn't died, but like Marco's gone through some stuff, and she's obviously upset about that. But he's saying, "What's going to destroy you and basically make you the rest of your life no, he's kind of horrible in a way is the fact that." Your husband died like yeah, that, he says that never really gets better the first person that you loved dying is going to make the rest of your days pretty shit yeah um which is probably one of the saddest things i've read in a while it's pretty sad especially when you like want someone to have some type of <laughs> not advice but like here's how i cope with it and they're no, like, like there is no hope well, yeah like how i dealt with it uh is that i didn't <laughs> dr oswald heist or d oswald heist heist that's what this is his is. name um, the, uh, Marco's ex-girlfriend is named Gwendolyn and then the ghost nanny is Isabel and Barr is Marco's dad. Yeah. And his mother's name. <laughs> read all of them. Uh, I met the people that we talked about so far that were like ghost nanny. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we're also calling her Marco's mom. What's her oh, name? Oh yeah. Her name is, uh, it's Kiara. Is it? Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty awful. Um, so after that happens, <laughs> oh no, I think it's Clara. Clara. I think that's an L. Yeah, oh. it is. Um, so we go back to where uh, the will is, um, and he kisses, um, what's her name, Gwendolyn, um, without her consent, 
because he is hallucinating and seeing the stalk. Maybe. Maybe. Um, maybe hallucinating. I don't know. Like It is the stalk. He, he is seeing the stalk. I don't maybe know he's if it's hallucinating. or if it's her ghost. I'm pissed about it. She um, kisses him back at first. Does she? Her eyes are open, and the next panel, her eyes are closed. So my assumption in that, like, her eyes are open in shock. Yeah. And then the next panel, her, her eyes, she doesn't look shocked, and her eyes are closed. Well, the Will's a pretty big fucker about it, actually. Yeah, I mean... He's like, oh, yeah, well, you fucking prudish. He's like, you, it's not my fault you guys are so uptight. Yeah, he is. I mean, to play devil's advocate... He is seeing a naked spider woman who's telling him to he kiss people. Clearly, is <laughs> so not. He's in, not in a good place. When he maybe we <laughs> it, we don't know if that naked spider woman is technically really there or not. No, I mean he's seeing her. He is. She may not be there. <laughs> she might not. Yeah. Um. And also, it's his ex lover, sort of enemy. It's fucked yeah. up. The stalk. Um, uh, actually, him kissing a girl against her will is not even the most fucked up thing that happens in that whole scene. It's him fucking maybe hallucinating a giant spider woman. A naked spider woman, yeah. yeah. Um, so then we see Sophie, the former slave girl from the planet Sextillion. Don't talk about that. That's the thing I don't want to spoil. Uh, why? I Because... Because the way... spoiling the whole issue. Well, I know, but the way it hit me, like, seriously, was so, like like special and like yeah. hit me emotionally that I don't want to ruin that for people. I want people to experience that page. It is just a great page of comics. You're like assuming it's a that they're page. going to listen to the, the rest of our interview. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think we're doing? <laughs> Brian K. Vaughn's here, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're going to listen to the rest of this review and have all of that shit spoiled. And I mean, at this point, not, <laughs> I, I don't really care how they're listening to it. I just don't want to spoil. I don't, I, I would rather that be experienced the way it's supposed to be. That particular thing, the way it hit me was so specific to the panel progression, the lettering, the art, the story, everything coming together that, like, I'd rather just let people experience that. You'll know when you get to it. It's going to be the only thing we haven't talked about. Not true. I, the entire first, like, third of the book we haven't talked about. <laughs> That's true. I disagree with you, and I'm going to agree to not talk about it. You think it should be experienced by someone telling you about it? No. Um, <laughs> but I don't think we would be ruining it or taking it away from someone. I just don't want to... That that moment was like it seriously meant so much to me, and it made me so sad slash happy at the same time. I wouldn't and I wouldn't want to rob that from someone else. Like I wouldn't want to wouldn't would not want to run the risk. Would immediately of altering that for somebody. What happens immediately makes Sophie's character infinitely more interesting. Yeah, um, and a lot harder to comprehend uh, who she is and how things she's been through. It's it's a it's an well, awesome also moment. gives a uh, lion cat a lot of potential character like it does like i don't know how much that cat is for is like just through his like through his uh very existence as a species is just basically has to say if, if stuff's lying yeah but or if it's oh you mean like choosing or if he chooses yeah because there's other times where it's been comical where he said lying about like if like the will's been talking about stuff where he's like and oh, i'm gonna do yeah. this and i'm and i'm an awesome dude and it's been like lying, lying. Like and it's it's came across as he's kind of poking fun at him. Or if you so if you wonder if it's an impulse that he can't control. It makes me this scene makes me wonder if if he is in control somewhat because that's what it looks like. Because well yeah and because in um and also now that I think about it he's not if he was if he was saying the word line every single time somebody said a lie he'd be saying it all the all time. The time. <laughs> yeah. And so BKV has kind of written it into where it has some type of impact. Yeah. I don't know. It was a really cool scene. Yeah, it was a really cool scene. It's 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 one of my favorite moments that's happened so far Mine too. in the series. Mine too, without a doubt. Which is weird. It is literally a page. Yeah, yeah. A single fucking page. One page. Um, what would you give this out of 10? Well, and then the well, beginning yeah. of the book, Alana's stepmom is being interviewed by those two reporter, like tabloid journalist yeah, guys. She has butterfly wings. Yeah. Um, so you get a little bit of glimpse into Lana's family and past. And yeah. then at the very end, um, you find out that it's like Prince, Prince robot, the fourth Prince robot, the fourth he had is chasing them. Yeah. He's going he's, after him. He's in the stalk, the giant spider woman's, uh, ship. Yeah. That's and, the, the shot of him pumping gas into the ship using like what we pump gas into it's the same thing. That I, was kind of weird. I mean, it didn't take me completely out of it because this, this world is. It's very bright, like it's not well. It's hard, hard sci-fi to where not. everything is so removed. But it was kind of, I I don't know. I hope that it was meant to be kind of funny, because it's goofy looking. It it I almost wondered if it kind of undercut the impact of like danger approaching. Yeah. Because when I saw it, I was like, 
That dude's uh, pumping some that's unleaded. Gas. Gas. That's literally a gas <laughs> that spaceship. Thing. I think they've done that purposefully, either for comedy's sake or because they're striking some sort of weird stylistic balance between the sci-fi fantasy and then tying it to our world. Yeah. Because if you were like, there are there's tons of analogs to our modern world. Well, like, there there are analogs, and then there are just pure, like basic, absolute things from our world, like that gas pump. Um, Alana reading that novel, it's literally a fucking paperback. She's in prison reading a, a mass market paperback. Yeah. And this, this, we don't even know if this is set in our universe. Um, it could be in our universe in the future, which that right there, I guess, could be meta commentary, like BKB saying print will never die. Mm-hmm. That's a stretch, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they are doing that thing where they want to, I don't know if it's because they want to be like, look, or, or maybe even just like subtly give us things that we can connect to, uh, so it doesn't feel so unrealistic. Again, that that might be a stretch, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know. It didn't take me out of it, but it was just weird because I was like, "Well, he's flying around in a fucking skull spaceship. It's yeah. a spaceship shaped like a skull with tusks, basically." I guess I almost expected it to not be so grounded. Like it's it's weird scene. It would be like if he was holding. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Like if he was holding an iPad, yeah, and not like a like a sci-fi looking iPad, like an Apple iPad. iPad. Like it, it just for a second, I would be like, "That's oh, an iPad," <laughs> yeah. and then kind of move forward. Yeah, it's a weird little visual thing. Uh, what do you give it out of ten stars? Eight. Um, that's very close to what I was going to give it. Seven and a half. Surprise. Good. <laughs> not surprised. Sometimes we disagree. Never. Sometimes. <laughs> On the first book, you're like, I just didn't like this. Uh, probably like five and a half. And I was like, I liked it a lot. Six. <laughs> Almost exactly not what I said. <laughs> I said, I, I said that it's, um, you're like, man, Curtis J. Weeby's awful. The art is worse. <laughs> the only thing that sucks more than the writing is the awful I, thing that they call art. I don't remember if listeners heard that or not. Uh, I don't remember. If the listeners heard that or not. So far, no one has, man. (laughs) Uh, Next book up, Sex Criminals Number 1 by Matt Fraction. uh, Written by Matt Fraction. Illustrated by Chip Zdarsky. Uh Is that how you would pronounce it, you think? It is. The cover to this is great. It's amazing. It's a woman uh, with a book in her crotch. She's naked holding a dildo. It's a whip, I guess. It's a whip. Um, It's like a cat of nine tails. Well, this like anal bead rib thing is what... You could probably use that handle as a dildo. See, that's what I'm thinking. And then a gun. Um, Which you could also use as a dildo. uh, You could. (laughs) Um, I don't know, and I'm going to look up as you talk about the book, who colored it and lettered it, because it's not in the uh, digital copy that we got from Image. I didn't like this book. (laughs) Okay. Let's lead off with that. All right. Um, I love Matt Fraction. Uh, He's one of my Googling sex criminals, by the way, by itself. Very different results. (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and add in uh, image. No, not image. <laughs> not fraction. <laughs> yeah. Typing in just sex criminals is a bad yeah, idea. Yeah, no, it didn't work how I was hoping. Um, I like Fraction a lot as a writer, and he's one of my favorite current writers. Uh, Casanova is a great series. Uh, it's something that I didn't connect with right away, but grew on me after I read more of it, and I fucking love it now. His Iron Man stuff, amazing. You know, he's written a lot of great stuff. Um, this isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't think this is among his, his, uh, his worst stuff by, by any means. But it's not, it's not, it's not terrible, but the concept it's is just clearly so, not for me. It's just so goofy. Bas- essentially the concept of the book is that when this woman, uh, named Susie has an orgasm, she stops time. Yeah. And, um, enters into this like sort of in between zone. Everything's like dulled out in terms of sound and it's it's like bright and kind of hazy it's very pretty in terms of visuals and at first when i first read the book i i thought it was just a way for them to represent orgasms visually that's but maybe even just specifically female orgasms yeah um because you see Susie and this guy having sex in the bathroom yeah at first you don't realize that she stopped time the first time it happens to her when she's a kid well, no, on the very first page it happens. It's either the first or second page where they're in the bathroom. That's yeah. the first time you see but, it happen. But you don't know that time stops. No, you don't know what's going on. It just looks like they are both uh, climaxing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say it looks like they're boning. It does look like that because they, they are. are boning. <laughs> they're having sex uh, of the heterosexual kind. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's very pretty. The colors, the design of it, it's it's very visually attractive. Um, <laughs> Emery's giggling over here. The um, okay. Here's the thing. The concept. Once I realized what it was, I was like, uh, "That's where I was lost." All right, dude. Like, it's, you know, no. Before that, even I was lost. Before that, even I think I 
I like I liked her character. I do too. And I liked reading about her growing up. Me too. And I liked reading about her interactions with other people. We talked about the word faggot and how awful it is earlier. Yes. This book is a good example of using um, it. Someone using it in a well, there's only a one way to use it, I guess, a in a derogatory way. way. Um, I mean, we're not using it derogatorily well, so much. But as we're, we're talking as about as it because it is derogatory. Ref- referencing it, Emery's making your cat draw on his iPad. <laughs> Um, and, uh, all that stuff was great. I like the way he wrote the book. It's kind of Hawkeye ish in a way where it's, it's kind of tongue in cheek and a little bit more personal. I think he strives for it, but doesn't achieve it. It's definitely not Hawkeye. It's well, I don't mean strives to make like it Hawkeye's large. not in this book. Y- you're right. I thought he was going to be, Matt, <laughs> and I was very disappointed. Matt Fraction's largest failing is that Hawkeye's <laughs> not in this book. No, um, I think he, he does write it to be funny. Yeah. Um, I think there were a couple places where I specifically, um, immediately signed off. Um, it was where the narrator was constantly promising that the jokes were coming. Yeah, um, I, I didn't dig on that too much either. Well, that right there is me. I see that as she's talking to me, the reader. No, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to have this argument for the hundredth time. We can have about, have it later. And then the second one was. But where what she, if where what if it is something like a document within the world? It could be because that's what Scarlet was. It could be. Yeah. Um, as of this issue, I, I, I can't say that it's not, but it looks almost 100% to not be that. Well, because what about Hawkeye? Because he does the same thing in that. Where he says what? Wait, this looks bad. Or, or hold on, this only looks bad or whatever. He says it a million times. Well, he says, I forget how he says it. Uh, um, this only looks bad, I think is what I, I can't remember what the phrase is. He uses it a bunch. Uh, who knows? It might be the same thing. I don't remember right now. Um, no, but I'm saying why does that? I don't. I can't remember what he sp- he actually says in Hawkeye. Um, That's what it is. It's this only looks bad. Like he says it at the beginning of the first issue, beginning of the second issue. I think all the way up through like the fourth. For some reason, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't matter. Let's talk about sex criminals. I know, quick. but answer my question. Why is that? I don't remember if that's what he says is what I'm saying is I can't tell you that that's different because I don't know if he doesn't say that or he does. He does. I'm telling you definitively that he does. I'm saying we're, he's telling us look at the scene that we are seeing in the comic. Well, how does that differ than this where she's saying like, I don't know if that's <laughs> what he says. Okay. Why can't you believe me? <laughs> because I know that it is. Because I want to see it. Okay. Like, I just want to see it. <laughs> All right. In, in Sex Criminals, she says... um with a little help of some editing. She's like, and with the help of some editing, we end up here. And that was another part where I was like, oh, don't don't be like, and that's how we edited out these comic book pages. Yeah. But she doesn't. She doesn't say that. No. Um, yeah, and that stuff's you. Like, No, that's what I said. Like, specifically me, like, when I interacted with those things, I was like, oh, gosh. All the stuff about her growing up, I didn't think it was going to be, and then I had this power that was brought on by by coming. Um, and then when it made that turn, first of all, that's when the title made sense to me. Um, because then I was like, oh, literally, sex criminals. Yeah, like, you're not. They're not like stealing sex, but I, I get it. Yeah. Um, and then there was a, I don't know, man. It was like maybe like two pages where they ran through all these sexual positions, and it just didn't. It didn't hit for me at all. I thought that part was kind of funny. It was, I was only supposed to be for comedy. Yeah, it was. Um, it it didn't land for me at all. I was just like, all right, I just I want to get through these panels. It reminded me a lot of. Uh, I don't even think Fraction wrote it. It was Jason Aaron, wasn't it? That Immortal Weapons, where he was like, the slap of a thousand ball sacks or or something like that. Yeah, it was the Fat Cobra issue. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, it it fell short for me. I I wasn't interested in learning about them fucking and then going and stealing things. I'll read another issue of it, but um, it's not, it's not amazing. I, the, the concept, the main concept of it isn't that interesting to me, but I didn't think the writing was bad at all. I thought the writing was good. I like Zdarsky's art too. I do um, too. His art's good. So it's, it's definitely one that I'm more interested in in terms of the creator owned stuff that Fraction's doing right now. It's a lot better than Satellite Sam. Oh. Um, so I I want to read more of it to kind of see where it goes because he's enough of a unique voice that I want to follow it. He is a unique voice, and this is absolutely a unique book. Um, it's pretty easy to say there's nothing else on the shelf like this, um, which I don't know. Like the concept of of them being it, like of them showing sex or or like dealing with sex in the book, it almost seemed like they were shying away from 
from being graphic about it. I didn't think so at all. <laughs> it was a pretty graphic book. Like the the only we see we see genitals like once, a lot more than once. <laughs> really? Yeah. At the end when they when they have sex. Um, that was the he, o- that was the only time I remember seeing any actual nudity, and not like I was like, yeah, gotta yeah. see some nudity. There's a lot of nudity in that scene, and then um, I mean the stick figure thing. Obviously, there's nudity well, yeah, there, yeah. But... I meant like uh, like photorealistic drawn bodies. Um. I guess I don't understand what your point is. <laughs> it just seemed like they were framing it to, almost like they were publishing it through like Marvel, where it's like, here's this naked person, but he's either in shadow or he's framed so that something is covering him, or like here's this girl with like hair covering her nipples. Um, well, are you saying it as like a criticism, like they shouldn't have, like you felt like it was sugar coated? Yeah, kind of. I mean, when that girl. Uh, quote rubbed one out through her faucet in the tub i immediately didn't think that they were sugarcoating anything like that set the tone for me from the beginning that it was going to be pretty well see it's frank it's such a weird thing to say because it's making me sound like i'm like show me everything <laughs> like let's see let's... well no i don't mean that but i mean like it, um or well, the they... idea that they were like shying away from it because i didn't think that at all i thought that well, they were pretty upfront with it they're frank um it's just a, it it seemed almost like visually they were um limiting themselves it's such a hard thing to talk about you might sounding weird you might just be a sex offender man (laughs) (laughs) maybe no like that scene uh, maybe uh, this was good to talk about because you realize crossing borders no like um it just seemed like they were um not limiting themselves so much as trying limiting your boner limiting my pleasure yeah um uh i felt very don't draw that emory i felt very unpleased um no it just it's i especially from a book called sex criminals and, and and i've also seen stuff that matt fraction has tweeted about this book where he's like i got the word it's seriously like cum bubble or like something really gross like grosser than that even if i remember he's i like, mean if you want to read the word cum bubble man it might be an issue too it might be <laughs> if that's what you want well, i know i know there's like some dildos coming in issue eight from what i read on it might have been zadarsky's twitter but it might have been fractured it's a dildo too. on the cover dude uh, yeah, it's not necessarily a dildo as much as it's a whip that, that you could fuck someone with if yeah. you wanted. Easily. Um, you could also use that gun as a bong if you wanted. Yeah. Um, can you use a handgun as a bong? A handgun? Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> what? What was, the, what's the movie where the dude's... Narc. Narc. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. He smokes weed out of a shotgun and accidentally blows his own fucking head off. <laughs> it's dark, but the funny part is when it cuts back to Ray Liotta, he goes... <laughs> he does that Ray Liotta laugh. Yeah, he does. <laughs> um, I, I don't really have anything else to say about this book. Uh, I give it a six. Really? Yeah. That's weird, man. About the same. About the same experience that I had with um. I forgot the name of it. Rat- I, I always want to call it Rat Cat Rat Catcher, but it's Rat, Rat Queens. Queens. What's Rat Catcher? That Virgo crime book. It's Andy Diggle. Um, book. For me, it's probably like a four. Uh, last book up, East of West, number six. Written by Jonathan Hickman, illustrated by Nick Dragata, um, colored by, not Russ Wooten, uh, Frank something, Frank Martin, and lettered by Russ, Russ Wooten. I feel like this is the book that we're going to have a hard time talking about. Um, I have to read it again. Like I, I, it's, I, I, almost, I almost was like, let's not talk about it, because I, there was a lot that went over my head. Um, See, not for me. I understood what was happening, but I want to read it again in terms of the the greater scheme of the book because they don't focus on the characters you've been focusing on for the past five issues. They jump to new characters. I feel like this probably matches up as far as storylines with issues like one and two and maybe three. Yeah, probably. Um, It goes a lot into the, the whole prophecy that they have and like the original like meeting of the five or whatever it was called. Yeah. And uh, all the different nations meeting. And then it goes into a new storyline with completely new characters that sets up a completely different yeah. slice of the universe in terms of judges and uh, uh, rangers. The the Texas Rangers basically become judges like Judge Dredd. Yeah, like literally, they. Be- it's almost kind of on the nose because they too on the nose. They have masks that look like Judge Dredd. They do not exactly like Judge Dredd, but it it's, covers the top half of their it's re- faces. It's reminiscent of that. Um, I'm guessing that was on purpose. If not, then those guys uh, Nick, sued. Nick Dragata and. <laughs> Um, Hickman must have just been not, I, I, there's no way they don't know. They have to know. I think it was probably a reference, um, um because this book from the little I've read of judge dread in 2000 AD and stuff. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't, it's not exact or, uh, 
East of West isn't exactly like like that, but there's yeah. similar concepts yeah. in, in terms of atmosphere and stuff like that. I thought it was a really good issue. I really liked it. Um, but I was like, I'm going to have to read it again. Yeah. And I'm probably going to need to read the first trade again and then read this to, to fully remember because Hickman, I think is an amazing writer and uh-huh. he, he loves packing in so, so much story and plot and history within yeah. like two pages. Oh yeah. If so like there's, there's seriously probably 50 years worth of stuff that has been told to me uh-huh. that I don't remember. In, because in it, the six issues, yeah, yeah. Because the first issue it covers a lot of time. The first half of it is essentially a history, le- a fictional history lesson. Also, I, I, what you should do, readers, if you remember our reviews from last week, read "God Is Dead," and then read this issue. Is that what it's called? "God Is Not Dead." "God Is Dead." Whatever that Avatar book. Yeah, uh, y- you can tell. Man, I don't remember it being called that. I thought it was called "God Is Dead." It probably is. Um. Anyway, with this issue. I the the only negative thing I can think to say about this issue is that I found two typos. Like that's it. <laughs> really? Where were they? At? Uh, in the flashback, I think in bo- in the flashback, both of them were both in the flashback. They used the incorrect form of its in one bubble, and then there's a word that was supposed to be deleted, um, and it didn't get deleted because it makes no fucking sense. There's a chance that though you won't see those listeners. Oh yeah, because this Maybe. is off of the image FTP. But yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, Potentially, yeah, it's it's hard telling. Um, and the sex criminals, I think it's it was listed as like an ad, advanced reader copy on the FTP, wasn't it? It wasn't a finished file because it it didn't have a credits page in it. Yeah, it said fractions, Adarsky on the front, and that was all all uh, we knew. Um, East to West is just one of the best books on on the stands. That's probably more than anything one of the reasons why it's going to be hard for us to review them is uh, it's like lock and key or like yeah, which we haven't been reviewing. It's been coming out. Yeah. The, the an issue came out last week and the idea of reviewing it, I mean, it's going to be like, this is awesome again. Well, not even really that as much as it's, it's, it's kind of like at this point how saga has become. Yeah. Not that it's just awesome again. Cause not all the issues of lock and key and not all the issues of saga, not all the issues of East to West are going to be awesome. Not all the issues of anything we've ever talked about have been all awesome. Yeah. But it's, um, well, it's, quali- it's just so hard to talk about something when there's so much story and history. Well, like, th- th- yeah, that's another. If this thing. is somebody's first episode, like, we're not doing this book justice in terms of explaining. Like, unless you take away from it that we think that it's an amazing book and you should definitely be reading it and should go buy the trade, that's what you should take away if you've never heard anything about this book or never read it. But talking about like all these oh, characters yeah. in the history, it's kind of a waste of time because we have to talk about so much. The biggest and, and most important thing to take away from this quote unquote review. It's not a review. <laughs> is that East of West is an, is an amazing book that has to be read. Yeah. Um, if you like comics and, and the format of comics, um, there's a chance you might not like the content or the storyline. There's no chance you'll love it. Yeah, 100% does. guaranteed. This is the best book you'll ever read in your life. Um, no, it's just, it's just some of the best work that's being done right now by, by the entire creative team. It's amazing. Every single issue that we've read so far has been like this. Some of them have been confusing, but it was probably just because we're dumb. <laughs> it's because we're stupid. <laughs> um, this issue, you know, you, you get more backstory of, of characters that you've seen up to this point. Um, and like David said, this is obviously the beginning of another storyline, and it's another, it's another like layer to the world that this team is building. And um, this issue has one of the grossest and scariest things I've seen in a comic in a while. Um, that judge, the judge is pretty gross, but the, ju- the thing I'm talking about is that like demon, oh, that comes out tentacle mouth, yeah. like, Oh, the panel where that dude gets his head blown off is pretty awesome. It is. Um, I have a really, this is going to sound, this is going to sound earlier. Like when you were like, man, I, I like, want to more... see more pussies, <laughs> more bush in this book. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, the, I really That's like to come back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> I really like, out of I really like within the terms within, um, like, uh, when they can stylize uh, like wounds or violence or something within a comic to where it doesn't look how it would actually look. Oh yeah. So, but they draw it in a way like, like yeah, like that guy's head getting blown off. It's literally getting blown off, blown off. And then what you can see of it happening is like, if you were to, <laughs> if you were to actually blow someone's head off, correct. How, like how has it looked when you've dreamed of it? David? <laughs> uh, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look like that. It's like uh, akin to the same or like the same concept. Um, like when Jock, draws lights yeah. like lights off of police sirens almost like a flare like well a, like he draws what's how like geometric shapes it's like mignola with flames kind of yeah it's not 
something they could easily do. They could have the colorist just make like a blur effect or yeah. like something on there. He'll draw it out. And the way um, Dragata does it in this is just so so stylized. Well, the, the art the way, looks amazing. The way the coloring, um, the way the coloring shows you that you're in a flashback. Yeah, it is so subtle and so immediately recognizable. Um, I don't. I can't remember which issue did it first, but I was going to say I think. I mean, I agree with you, but I think we might be kind off with what's well, yeah. they basically taught you in the very first issue. Yeah. Those um, are this is a flashback. Yeah, what you're seeing, and at this point, it's just it's really not a, a, a big difference in the coloring. It's no, not really. kind of a, a very well, min- and then, minimal filter. And then once you um, was okay. Well, I, this is another reason why I think I need to read it again. Where the dude, where the dude shoots the judge, is that flashback? Yeah. See, okay, so that's not the coloring's not changed there. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. From what I read, it was. No, it's not because they the, when they first show the judge and they first show the proceedings, um, it's it's colored that's in, in this flashback right here, like the grays and the reds, and then immediately this stuff like no, it's got the flashback filter over it, man. Yeah, but this right here is the that's like an, th- that's a flashback within the flashback, and they use the gray. Oh yeah, and the black stuff. Yeah, it's a so they switch it. it. Yeah, they switch it, but it's not. Um, like at first, it was enough that I was like, "Oh, is this present day?" Because the page right before is gray and black. But then, as soon as you get into it, you realize that it's still flashback. Yeah. That way, you don't have to sacrifice coloring for like because flashbacks are a significant part of this this so, issue. So wait, did you not know that that judge stuff was a flashback? I did. Well, at first, when I turned the page and it was back in color from yeah. the previous page, I thought that it wasn't a flashback anymore. Oh. But the way that it leads into it, you can tell right away that it is. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying it's it. They did it in a unique way to where you're not. Um, they're not wasting color in the book yeah. because like the last, maybe like fourth of the book is flashback. So rather than just have like, you know, seven black and white pages, yeah, they can still have Frank Martin do his coloring, which is really good. It is. It's a lot of, it are, this is, there is a lot of flashback in this issue. And also, do you notice that daredevil's in the scene? <laughs> that's what he looks like. <laughs> that looks like daredevil. Um, it's a pretty hardcore, uh, issue as far as death and murder goes. Yeah, I mean that's nothing new no. <laughs> for this series. I just love this world so much, man. Yeah, um, this this I is mean, uh, Earth, like us, like right here. And I just right love now this world, man. This room. This, along with um, the other obvious favorites of mine, is up there, man. It's in my top five right now of current books coming out. Yeah. I, I'm always excited about it. I need to uh, I need to get caught up on um, his other book, Manhattan Projects, because I'm super super yeah, behind too. on it. I've only read the first trade. Uh, I think I've read the first issue. That's it? I think so. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, what do you give it? I give it an 8. Uh, yeah, I give it an 8, too. Great. Great. And now, a special news bulletin. Hideous Energy thinks you should read this. You should fucking read this is the name of the segment. It's dirty language. How I'm going to title everything from now on. Dirty language. You're going to find out why. Why? David. Tell me. <laughs> That's your segue, dude. Do it. Uh, yeah, I didn't take advantage. We were gonna go straight into it. Um, can you hear the crickets, listeners? <laughs> if you can, it's ambiance. Uh, it, it. This is indicative the, of uh, our jokes landing. Probably, Another yeah. <laughs> very cliche use of cricket noises. Uh, in this case, they're just re- regular, real life crickets. The windows are open. They are uh, in our car because we're recording in a field. We're not. Uh, Indiana's a field. <laughs> It's one big field. You should read this. America's butt field, Indiana. In America's butt field? That's what I chose to say. <laughs> <laughs> Choices that I made just now. Good job, man. <laughs> you should read this. I'm picking The End of the Fucking World by Charles Forsman. Um, potentially it's called The End of the Fucking World, but I like to drop that G. Maybe it's because I'm from the Midwest. Maybe not. Don't know for sure. Unfortunately, that actually is the name. You're not just adding a word in the like you of, did before. No, no. The, the, That's the title. The real title of the book is The End of the Fucking World. On the book it's, and also online, it's T-E-O-F-T-W. Yeah. Um, probably smartly in, in their case. I don't understand or like <laughs> that. That it's called The End of the Fucking World? Yeah, it's like that band, too. Like, what? Um, Godspeed, you black emperor? <laughs> no. Star. Uh, star fucker? Star fucker, man. Uh, yeah, it's unneeded. <laughs> it is. Um, I just feel like it would be, um, you limit yourself immediately. Like, you do. Well, that's the thing is they limit themselves because they titled it at the end of the fucking world, but they immediately found a workaround by labeling the book T E O F T W. But that limits you. Yeah. Because then Tiff, 
No, oh, yeah, like <laughs> a reader's going to look at your book and be like, either they're going to be curious, yeah, or they're going to immediately be like, oh, I, I can't read whatever that's they're like. <laughs> that's a, that's Russian. I, that's not my language. I don't understand. Yeah, Austin, no compute. Austin, no compute. Yeah. Thank you, David. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. This is a book uh, that we both got at SPX. We did. Under false pretenses. Um, false pretenses. I told you, uh, because I had read a review of it. Oh, yeah, that it was about the apocalypse. Yeah, it was either a Twitter review, which is obviously very short, <laughs> <laughs> or I, some website was talking about this book, The End of the Fucking World. It might even have been that the BBC had just recently started filming the the adaptation of it because that is a thing that has happened and is going on. What really? Yeah. Of this? Yeah. You didn't know that? No. Yeah. It just got picked up by the BBC and they just started filming. Ah. Uh, yeah. Why? <laughs> why? I don't understand your question. I mean, we'll get into the book in a second, which we both liked. Let me preface it with that. We did. Um, I, it's is going to be like twenty minutes long. Like, there's not a whole lot of substance to this book. Is it a mini series or a movie or a TV show or what? I think it's a mini series. I don't think I don't think it's a choice. I don't think it's an ongoing series. If it is, then they're adding a lot. Man, that blows my mind. Well, this you're... is the last book in the world I would think that not me. BBC uh, would do would it adapt or what adapt adapt. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, if somebody was like, the BBC is adapting Josh Simmons' cockbone, I'd be like, hold the fucking phone! I meant, I meant literally, if I could, I could think of no other book, so... That's what I thought you meant. Why would you <laughs> no. say it if you didn't mean it? Because it's just an expression. I didn't mean actually the literally the last one. You're a liar. Okay. David Clarence Hopkins is a liar. All right, man. I want history to remember. Um, first of all, it's not about the apocalypse. Um, not in any sort of literal way. Um... That's what I told David after I read it, because I think I read it like a day before you did. I texted you immediately and was like, I liked the end of the fucking world. Either I misread the review or somebody was being very metaphorical. Yeah, I don't really understand why it's called that. I mean, I guess I kind of do. Um, I can see why thematically yeah. it would be called the end of the fucking world. It is the story of two teenage kids who fall in love. Um, one of them is a severely mentally damaged, emotionally damaged. Arguably, both of them are. Yeah. Uh, the, the I man, would say that they the, both are. The, one, obviously, more than the other. Yeah, but. the boy in the situation is, is a sociopath um, who likes to kill animals and... Um, Hurt himself. It's, ba it's basically all of those warning signs that you see or, or things that you see... Uh, like criminal profilers talking about serial killers, serial killers, like these things that these are the things that serial killers do before they become either brave enough or like ready to kill a person Like they'll torture animals. They'll self mutilate. They do all of these things. Um, and that's what this kid's doing. Um, and then he finds a girl who she doesn't have anything specifically like sociopathic about her. She runs away from home. Um, and, hooks up with this kid um and i guess that might be one of the reasons why she could potentially be emotionally damaged is because she finds something in this kid um it's a very spare book um both yeah. from art and story um which i think charles forsman from what i read because not only did we buy the end of the fucking world when we were at spx but we also bought working on the end of the fucking world uh, a zine that charles forsman made uh, about the process of making the the comic, um, which I guess it won best mini comic at the Ignats. Um, the making of it? No, the end of the fucking world. Oh yeah, um, which he published. I think it did. He had published through his comic, which is Oily Comics. Yeah, um, through his publishing like press. Yeah, yeah, he has his own his own publishing press called Oily Comics, which apparently they sell their stuff for super fucking cheap. Like actual printed versions of all their stuff is available for like a dollar. Yeah, I mean they're they're mini comics, like they're little, like. Not mini comics in the like mini comics is a broad term. Like it can it mean is. a lot of different things. But like when I think about mini comics, that's what I'm thinking of. Like the really small, like a zine. Like yeah, well, I mean that's so yeah, broad yeah, too. Yeah, it's all they're all subjective. But like the um, like the, it's like it would be like the quarter of a piece of paper then folded in half, like real little. Yeah, and they had a bunch of those at his uh, at his booth. Yeah, um, in that in that working on the end of the fucking world uh, mini comic, he talks about wanting to do something very spare and something very different than some of the other stuff he's done where line work is almost just nothing. And, you know, for the most part, that's what this book is. I wonder why they didn't, 
That would have been gray, like gray tone it. No, I wonder that would have been awesome to have in the book to explain that. Well, no, 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 just to have that extra content. Yeah. Like that's, I wonder why they didn't. Fanagraphics is the one who published yeah, Fanagraphics the picked book, it up. which is weird that he wouldn't, I don't know. I guess I don't understand enough about oily comics because this was the first time I'd ever heard of them. Dude, I have, okay, this is pure speculation. Okay. Complete speculation. I have nothing to base this off of, so let that be a disclaimer. <laughs> Great. I think that he is secretly a goat. <laughs> oh, I know. I, 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 I can't tell you you're wrong. I, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't wonder if there, if there's like a, anything bad between him and Fanagraphics. I don't think that, but, um, two things one when we bought it from him yeah he didn't have it on his table he pulled it out of a box that he had behind the table and is like his bag he it had makes... copies of it and when he signed it he put he wrote under fanographics and oily press really he hand wrote it in my mind i'm sure he did it in yours too i didn't notice that um so it makes me wonder if uh like what if there was a deal or what the deal entailed or whatever else i wondered about that because it is strange that he has obviously a, at least successful enough that it's you know it's definitely being recognized and he's gotten some um, some press or whatever from it. Yeah, his own press that's putting out this book and then Fanagraphics picks it up and publishes it. Obviously, it's it would seem to me to be a good move because he's going to get a bigger yeah um, a bigger more exposure too. Well, immediately also the but it makes it made me wonder like how it shook out because which is such a strange concept. To he me. didn't have the like that's his that's like I would imagine I don't know I don't know if it's his biggest book but you're right though like when he didn't have him out he was walking away from his table. And I saw him, and I said, Charles Forsman, and he turned around. I was like, hey, do you have any of your book left? And he's like, yeah, I've got a few. And then he went back behind the table, and you're right, it was in a box. Yeah. Um, which isn't, you know. And they didn't have any at the Fanagraphics booth. Well, he had been at the Fanex, Fanagraphics booth. I know, but, I mean, all the times when we went by there, they didn't have them for sale. Well, he, when he was there, they were there. Did he have, like, he had some in front of him or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it so. makes me wonder if maybe, maybe it was like, and the way I'm talking about it makes it sound very gossipy, like there's some like bad blood. I don't mean that, but it just makes me wonder how he views it, because like, potentially he has some kind of deal to where, at least at this con, he's selling the book himself, yeah. and not Fanagraph. It's not at their booth or whatever. Well, that's an know. interesting it's question, curious. because I had never heard of the book until Fanagraphics picked it up, Yeah, which is certainly not anyone's fault. No. Um, but, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird concept. Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you don't like very spare art or very spare storytelling, I think there is very there's interesting character development within within the story. Yeah, I no, I like it because there is narrative and character development. There is because there's a lot of stuff at SPX that I always end up coming home with. Where I'm like, <laughs> where I'm, uh, I know I don't mean even I don't I mean specifically like oh no it's like people brought their stuff and are selling there. Like it's well, not from drawn and quarterly. Like, it's not from fan graphics. Feast. Where feesh, I'm rolling the dice. Feast showed us some stuff where we were like, you immediately were like, Austin's going to hate that. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, like six pages and it's like fucking octagons. Yeah. And then the octagon like opens up and becomes a, like a tetrahedron. Like, yeah, great. <laughs> it's like fucking great. Riveting. <laughs> yeah. Like that's awesome. I mean, it's, it, it's just weird because you have to, you have to warp your head around into a different, um, a different like put a different pair of glasses on yeah. because you it they're it's still a comic. It is, yeah. but you're so used to reading comics as opposed well, to looking at pieces of art that as as a medium in terms of a medium are comics. But yeah, like there's tons of stuff. Like if you want if you want to know what we're talking about, buy a copy of the best American comics any year. Any year. there's amazing year. stuff in there. Yes, um, uh, in every single in every single volume they've ever done. I have a couple of them, yep. or I did. They're really good. <laughs> they don't I, last long. Well, I don't know what happened to them. You lost one. I remember that. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea what happened to it. Anyway. You and I buy them pretty regularly from half price Kind books. of stupidly because... No, it's an absolute dumb idea Then there's idea stuff in there time. where it's like a dude drew, drew like a tree 16 times in a row with crayon. Yeah. And like that's it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's, it, you have to interact with it in a much different way. My whole point is this book is not that. It's not that. No. So, luckily, it's I, I was kind of worried that I would be getting into something where it's like... Art. Here's some trees. Here's some trees. <laughs> Charles Forsman absolutely utilizes character development, character arcs, story arcs, um, and it's a short book. It's all well, yeah. It's all very, very, very minimal, but it's all very much there. It is, um, and there's emotional impact. At least there was for me. Um, it is a dark book. Yeah. So knowing these things, if all of that sounds like something that you would like, you should read it. Um, if not, maybe don't. Maybe don't read it. Um, <laughs> but it's. I, we should do a segment, a longer segment, and maybe even have some people on it on it to talk with us about very minimalistic art or very like fucking experimental um, 
shit. <laughs> I don't mean sh- I don't mean shit like derogatorily. Yeah. Um, I, it's a euphemism for stuff. Um, for like the sort of like impressionistic stuff because that's something I have a very hard time with is yeah, I, not only that there's stuff some, it happens all the time at DCBS where we're like ooh look at this cover and you flip pretty. through it and it's like pictures of birds yeah and sometimes like <laughs> ph- like photography yeah of birds uh-huh. and it's and it's a quote unquote comic by well, there, and yeah there'll be like a, a, a word balloon every sixth page and it'll be like ha! yeah <laughs> and like on on a good day, I'm like, oh, okay, I don't like this. This isn't for me. On another day, on I'm like, day. this isn't a comic. No, on a, on a bad day, many many <laughs> harsh the, words are said. <laughs> just the most disgusted responses. Well, I have a, I have a hard time with that stuff, uh, which we talked about with Stephen Christie and all those guys when we did the Arkea show at Chicago about comics that either are visually driven and not necessarily narratively uh, organized or driven by narrative. I have a hard time with that. I do too. Um, but then I also have a hard time with that stuff where it is the Johnny Ryan, like prison pit stuff where I guess Josh Simmons might be in that, in that troop too, where Michael DeForge. Yeah. This like very, very kind of like harshly, almost like visually antagonistic stuff Yeah, where, and I don't even mean content wise. Um, although that's what I think of when I think of Johnny Ryan, like just like people getting their throats slit. Yeah. Like really gritty, um, gross yeah, I stuff. Think of Josh Simmons. Um, <laughs> that's the guy I go to. That's the kind of stuff that I I have a really hard time with too. So I think it would be cool to talk about that sometime. Um, figure out my feelings. <laughs> one one thing, and we normally don't go off on tangents, so I apologize Never, in advance. Um, that I, it's been on my head a lot, and this is just kind of kind of connected to what you're talking about. Oh. Um, in reality, not really at all. But I wanted to talk to you about it because it's been on my mind. Cool. Um, let's. Do there it. might be some of that in this book. Yeah. Um, well, and the end of the book and yeah. the fucker world the uh the idea of shit like building and defining and showing character through only visuals um and, and i mean about visuals the visuals of them in terms of like what they look like oh you mean their physical characteristics like changing their physical appearance or or things that are there that aren't explained or talked about or like to give you an example like uh and glorious bastards brad pitt's character with Aldo Rain has a neck yeah, scar, a scar, like he's been hung. Yeah. Um, it what got me thinking about it was Amanda and I went and saw that movie Prisoners that's in theaters right now, uh-huh. and the main detective in it, played by Jake Gyllenhaal, I absolutely loved. Yeah. And I, and, I can't believe I've never fucking heard of that movie. <laughs> I'm so pissed off. And in ter- and in terms of the movie, yeah, you find out one thing about his his past. That's it, and it is a sentence. Yeah. He has about six different facial tics. He has he's covered in tattoos, and a lot of them look like they were done by himself. Hmm. And he buttons his top his buttons on his shirt all the way up, and buttons the top button, and doesn't wear a tie. And there were all these little things in the movie that I would notice over time that got me so obsessed with his character and like, like who was he? infatuated. There's one line where he talks about how he grew up in a boy's home, and that's the only bit of information you get about him, other than what you learn in the movie about his like present character. Yeah. But then it got me thinking about any other situation like that where we've seen in movies or comics or whatever else where we are given one piece and it's not explained or whatever, but it indicates immediately that there's some type of past there. Yeah. Um, that particular thing I looked up later and the writer, which this was crazy too, the writer of that movie and I'm completely forgetting his name. I'll look it up as we're talking about it, but it, this was that script for prisoners was on the Hollywood blacklist or whatever, um, for a really long time, which is the, the list of like unproduced screenplays that people say are completely awesome, but that they just can't get made. Yeah. Like Chronicle was on there for a really long time. I think stranger than fiction was on that same kind of list really? for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> movie so good. Um, and, uh, this dude until this movie got made was uh, stuffing envelopes in New York in an office. Really? And then like this movie got made. And That's not what you, you didn't need to search for that. No, I have to hit Denzel magnification. <laughs> um, his name's, uh, Aaron, Gizkowski, Gizkowski. I'm so pissed off. I've never heard of this movie. Like, just continually, the second you told me you had seen this, I was like, "What are you talking about? Why don't you fucking shut up and quit <laughs> making shit up?" But I, I looked it up. And there's an interview with him, and he talked about how uh, Jake Gyllenhaal did all of it. Really, all of that stuff. Made He's, all of that up. He said. He said that he asked the writer about some stuff, and the writer was like, "Here's what I have about his character, like these things," and then. Jake Gyllenhaal did. He was like, I want to wear, I want to button my shirts all the way up to the top. I want to do these tattoos. He has a Freemason's ring on. 
Um, that's crazy. And figured it all out. And it's he has these facial tics, man. Like his, I love Gyllenhaal. I do too. His, I love him. His performance in it is so awesome because it's so different than in Zodiac. I kept thinking of him in Zodiac because he's so different in Zodiac. It's so good. You absolutely need to rewatch Jarhead. Oh, really? Absolutely. Because yeah, Jill, he's, he's awesome. Jill and Hall's performance in Jarhead is one of my favorites of his. Really? There's one scene where he freaks out on another one of his fellow soldiers, and he's got a gun up to the guy's face. He's literally, like, screaming at this guy, and he's like, this is my rifle, there are many like it, but this one is mine. I'm freaking out on the guy. And he's like, he's going to shoot him in the face. And then after he freaks out on him for maybe, like, a minute, he turns the gun on himself. He puts a gun in his mouth Uh-oh. and is, like, freaking out like he's going to blow his own head off. And then he puts it down and just starts crying. And then in the special features, um, they they talk about that day, and they talk about the real fight that he and that actor got into, like, like off camera actual or whatever. fight. Yeah, because Jillian Hall got so into the scene that he like hurt the guy with the gun up against his face, and it made it pissed the guy off. So then they got into this like real altercation. I don't know if it was like a fist fight or like so much as it was like slinging words and for, back and forth at each other, but it I that movie. That's crazy. Yeah, it's so fucking good. He's uh he's pretty new like at for the most part low key in this no, no pun intended. His name's Detective Loki. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Wait. L O K I. Really? Yeah. Is that uh yeah, probably. Like it no, I mean like, like there... metaphorical or something? Yeah. Is yeah. there like he's a trickster? Uh well, he's not really a trickster. There's it's a pretty interesting I really liked the movie a lot. The la- the third act, like it gets pretty. That's, that sounded like there was a butt coming. No, no, no. I really did like it. The third act does get kind of expositiony to where um, people are like, and then I did this because of this, and they're kind of walking you through oh, it, like which kind of sucks. Yeah, because well, not so much monologue, but it's just kind of like walking you through what happened, the plot. which they weren't doing before. So that kind of I didn't like that because there's some people that have big problems with it. Most people really liked it, um, but it's the uh, oh another thing that's crazy when I look at her like pictures and when i think back in my memory of watching the movie i realize that it's her but i watched the whole entire movie not realizing that um uh what's her name melissa leo was in it <laughs> really yeah she plays this old woman like a 60 year old woman it's because she is she's great a changeling and uh she's like from whatever planet but it's that weird though she's from last of the mohican i was gonna say from. it's not like him and lincoln where you're like oh that's not him he's that, gone that's lincoln it doesn't even look like him it's not like that you can tell it's old her daniel day lewis daniel day lewis but when i was watching it i wasn't like oh melissa leo <laughs> i was like oh it's an old woman it's a crazy old woman. Uh, it's a good movie. That's not what I'm going to talk about. No, you should read something. Uh, I'm going to talk about The Secret History of D.B. Cooper, which is a book that we uh, reviewed the first issue of and then subsequently named the episode Dr. Seuss's Underwater Hell. Yeah. Because of that comic. Was it because of that? Yeah. Hmm. Because um, uh, this book by Brian Sharia, he yes. wrote and illustrated it, um, has D.B. Cooper, this famous uh, robber real life dude real life robber who uh, jumped out of a plane with how many was it like a million or two million or something i can't remember a lot of money he jumped out of a plane and they never found him no one knows what happened to him um so brian shria uh takes that and mixes it with like some mignola hellboy some really fucked up shit slash crazy gross stuff acid trippy stuff um and, and literally acid trippy because yes. what you find out in the first issue is that db cooper worked for the United States government yep. and did this thing where he would take this drug and it would take him into this other world and he would kill monsters and that would kill real life uh, communists. Wasn't there a bear? In the Cold War. Like a teddy bear? There is a teddy bear. That's it was thought. bombing around with him in the other world. Um, I, I'm not going to tell more than that, realistically. Like, it's the, the thing I like so much about it is that to me, I was very worried throughout the entire book that he wasn't going to stick the landing. I was like, no pun intended, because he jumped out of a plane. I don't mean that. I mean <laughs> Brian Sharia. Yeah. That he wasn't going to be able to have a, a satisfying conclusion tied up um, well and i liked it quite a bit the art is amazing uh the writing's really good too the coloring is one the coloring is great I remember. yeah it's it's a it's a really good book um it's i had my qualms at first about only publishing it in this giant hardcover it is bigger it, it's yeah and I, at first i was like oh great i'm gonna have to pay more money now because it's it's a hardcover and it's so big yeah i think it's like 25 or 30 bucks and then when you found out that the price wasn't a big deal then that's when you moved on to worrying about the size of it on your shelf um no it fits on my shelf it's not too big it fits on my bigger shelves but in comparison with the rest of your books the rest of your oni stuff Oh, I don't know. I don't even know if I what other own, if I have Oni in its own. I have some publishers together. Scott I don't know. If, yeah, but I don't know if I have enough Oni stuff to that I put it together in one thing. Queen and Country. You might. I only have one Scott Pilgrim book right now, though. 
You, you don't have your black and whites still? No, I gave them away. Oh, uh, I'm keeping them because of the stuff in the back. I'm going to have two. There's, not, there's nothing in the back. Yeah, there is. Of the black and white ones? Yeah. There's a playlist in one. There's some pages in another. So, like, all together for all six volumes, there's, like, four pages. Well, yeah, but it's stuff that's not in the colors, uh, the colored editions. Oh, I don't need the playlist, I guess. I don't care. Oh, I, I want to keep them, so. Uh, I didn't ask, so <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Thanks, man. I, yeah, I don't care about you either, so stop talking about stuff. It's fun. Um, <laughs> the uh, Also, I didn't care about the price after I remembered where we were standing uh, because in it was DCBS. discount comic book service. Yeah. Um, but in this case, it, it works in favor of the book because the art One is – the size. Oh, the size. The size of the paper, the size of the book. Because the art is so good. It is so detailed. Um, I read it. I Like, I started reading it one morning. I was like, I'll read a little bit of this before I go to work. And I read the whole thing. So I still need to it. finish it because I remember when we reviewed it. We only read one issue. Yeah. Unless you read more. Because Dude. when I finished the first issue, I was like, oh, this is all new. Nope. I don't remember. Uh, I don't even remember the whole first issue other than the bear and the acid stuff. Yeah. Um, also, like, I don't even think we ever got to the part where he actually jumped out of the plane. No, that's the that's the last page. There's a dog in the field with us now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the very end. That of the entire series. Yeah, that that it's I a like, six issue I mini like series. That. Yeah. Oh, I that's like, what I was getting ready to say. I like that a lot. Mu- it's not. Um, okay, so I, it was either last week or the week before we talked about Rassel yeah. and how if you love Tesla and you love history, you'll love Rassel. Yeah. If you want to read history of DB Cooper, not this. Don't book. read this <laughs> because the idea of this guy that got away with a crime by jumping out of a plane. A guy jumps out of a plane, and his name is D.B. Cooper. The entire yeah, rest it. of it, as far as I know, is is fictionalized. So, if you dig, if you dig on on Hellboy, there's a Mignola quote right on the front. Like, yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's very much that style. Well, I'm very happy he didn't. It wasn't that he set out to be like this is what really happened with D.B. Cooper. Not that that couldn't be interesting, but that doesn't immediately grab my interest just because that's one of those things that people have been doing since D.B. Cooper did what he did. Yeah, I mean, it is it does answer that question. But it is in such a way that, like... like who is D.B. Cooper? No, I mean, it answers what happened when he jumped out of the plane. Oh, yeah. But the answer is, is obviously so fictional well, yeah. that it's not even anything Normally, that... if someone is going to be like, what happened when D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane, the answer would not be, he entered into the alternate world that he uh, <laughs> likes to go into with his teddy bear. There's one thing that has always stuck in my head, too. Like, since then, I've, I've thought about it. He has a prologue that's after the the series is done after the six issues last page that's what a prologue is um no that's an epilogue (laughs) the the prologue is after the book's done not at the beginning and so that's an epilogue (laughs) yeah but it's but it's a prologue to the book but he could not put it at the beginning without spoiling oh what happened yeah but it's like three or four pages that he wrote and drew and um it says i don't know it always stuck with me because it's such a it's a really when you when you read it it's such a cool like emotional beat but, um, yeah, if it would have been at the beginning, it would have ruined Spoiled the entire the book. book. So it's interesting. It's got a lot of special features and stuff um, in it, too. So yeah, I'm super fucking pumped to read it. I'm going to get um, – this is unrelated other than Oni, but oh, cool. um, Stumptown Volume 2 finally oh, came out. I'm so I've happy. Been that. I'm so fucking happy. <laughs> I hope it has a bunch of features on the back. I do, too. Like the first one, Dick. That was one of my favorite parts of that hardcover. That whole that – whole, that's just one of the best – one of the best like packages, just all around comic book packages. That stump down hardcover so Pomoni is good. just amazing. That's my. Uh, we've already talked about this. What favorite Greg Rucka book? Uh, stump down. Yeah, without a doubt, mine too. That um, his Batgirl stuff is Batwoman. Probably, yeah, or Batwoman is probably pretty close uh, to being second though. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, Gotham Central's up there too. Oh fuck. Yeah, that's not a, that's not just a Rucka book though. He does that with other with other writers. Yeah, I know, but he they didn't. I think maybe one arc in that they co-wrote. That's a book that everybody attributes them, but they alternated arcs. They're yeah. they're credited as well. They that, had day shift and and night shift. But like, it, I mean, I guess in that case, then I mean, they're affecting each other's stories. No, it's it's still entwined, but it's a uh, it, it's different enough that you can tell. Yeah, like when you're reading the the Rucka arcs, they're very different. Yeah. Um. It, I mean, obviously not in huge ways. They're not like dinosaurs during the night shift, <laughs> but like you can tell that it's not Brubaker writing it and yeah. vice versa. Man, that series is so good. Yeah, it is. We need to figure out what we're going to do next for Club Book. No, nah, man. Oh. We don't figure this stuff out. We just let it happen. Oh, okay. I mean life. Oh, well, that's true. Well. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with it, that. It is, though. <laughs> Have you
have you ever been uh, alone in the woods and you needed a hatchet, but also you kind of wanted to read action comics? Yes. That's happened to me. Only it was a, it was kind of a similar situation. I was in the desert and I needed uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. Yes. Luckily, DCBS was there for me. Discount Comic Book Service. You can find them on DCBService.com. Yes. Online, they will uh, throw out parachutes of supplies and comics, little uh, like parcels, like in Lost, where they drop food. Yes. Onto the island. Is that is that your line? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, get you with your comic book fixins. They will. Um, DCBService.com. You can get so much awesome stuff on there for discounted prices. A lot of really good prices. Uh, anything you can think of. If you want to buy that gross Catwoman issue, they got it. That is there. If you want to read it, they're going to charge you for it, but they'll charge you like half off for it. They will give you a really good deal on it. You can also follow them on Twitter. DCB Service, yeah. DCB Service is their Twitter handle. If you're in the Fort Wayne, Indiana area, stop by their store. Um, we've already told some hilarious, hilarious stories about uh, yeah. stopping in there. Like, they'll punch you if you want if you want them to. We've said a lot of really funny high five. Seriously, if you go in there, we'll play it straight this time. They'll have a conversation with you and talk to you. They'll talk to you. They'll be nice. They'll sell you some comics. And then right after you leave, you can go to the Chinese place that's next door. Yeah, it's great food. We almost always go there. We always do. Go to DCBS. <laughs> <laughs> go to DCBService.com and get some comics.